Joseph Smith's last journal is not just one of many good primary sources from the period for describing Joseph's activities. In many real ways, it is the most important source, most fundamental source for understanding Joseph's life. It was in a revelation dated January the 19th, 1841, that the Lord said to Joseph Smith, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant, Joseph Smith, I am well pleased with your offering and acknowledgments which you have made. For unto this end have I raised you up, that I might show forth my wisdom through the weak things of the earth. It was in Nauvoo that the prophet Joseph Smith attained his greatest. It was also in Nauvoo where the most detailed journals of his life and works were kept. This special History of the Saints presentation is about the journal, the last journal, of the life of Joseph Smith. It's a very continuous, very compelling story, and really a conclusion of a series of tragic events. It tells, of course, the, the end of Joseph's life. It, it includes events about the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith and everything leading up to that point. So in many ways, it makes that last few years of Joseph Smith's life more personal and more immediately relevant to its readers. Readers may find this final volume of Joseph's journals to be a little different than what we would traditionally expect from a personal diary. It uh, not being kept by the subject, but instead by Joseph's clerk, Willard Richards, it doesn't include all of the same kinds of personal detail, insights, thoughts, feelings that someone might write in their own journal. But in many ways, uh, it's an um, equally valuable tool in a different way. Uh, because someone else is keeping Joseph's journals, they're able to look at his activities, his involvement in events, and capture his actions in a way that he might not choose to if he were recording his, his own life. The latest volume of the Joseph Smith papers is Journals 3. This covers Joseph Smith's life from May of 1843 to his death in June of 1844. It's basically the last 14 months of his life. It covers um, all sorts of significant events in Nauvoo. Uh, there's lots of work being done on the temple. If there is any one overarching story of this Journals 3 volume, it's of the disillusion of relations between the Mormons and their neighbors in Hancock County in Western Illinois. It's the ongoing theme of increased hostility, of decline in relations, of falling out politically, and of economic tensions. And that overarching theme is really a strength of the volume. Readers familiar with where this story ends, of course, in Carthage, will not be able to help seeing this build up in this direction that Joseph's life and that the lives of his colleagues are taking. My favorite thing about this journal, and to me, what is one of the neatest insights throughout the course of this journal, is Joseph's excitement about the work that he's doing as the president of the church and as the Lord's prophet. We've got all these things going on, all these distractions, all these threats against him, all these things that, that he could be worried about, and, and he is worried about them, but he doesn't let any of it derail him from what he's supposed to be doing, from his mission as he understands it. And he is pushing the temple forward, and he is getting people their temple ordinances. He's got the missionary work continuing unabated. He's calling missionaries. He's instructing the saints. Over 60 discourses in this journal, all of them generally on the lines of instruction and doctrine, and just moving the work forward, closing it up, finishing up what he needs to do, and, and being focused on on what the Lord has asked him to do. He made a choice to essentially give his life for this cause. He could have taken the experience and 
the sacred grove in any other direction, but allowed himself to be used as a tool throughout his life. And I think you really capture that in this, in this volume that leads right up to the very day of his death. I think that you see that, that willingness to, to submit his life for a greater good, to, to help the community. Early on in this volume, we read about the third attempt to extradite Joseph Smith to Missouri to stand trial on the charge of treason. He goes on a visit to Dixon, Illinois to visit some of Emma's relatives, takes the whole family. And while he is there, some officers show up and arrest him on this charge of treason and try to get him over the river into Missouri. News of his arrest reaches Nauvoo and sets off this massive rescue effort. Dozens of men on horseback leave Nauvoo trying to intercept him and his captors. Others get on the Maid of Iowa, a little steamboat that was there in Nauvoo, and they head down the Mississippi River and then up the Illinois River, just in case his captors try to get him to Missouri by water. And they are successful. Men on horseback eventually do intercept Joseph and his captors. In the meantime, Joseph's been able to convince his lawyers that Nauvoo is uh, a place where they could hold a hearing on the whole affair. And so he is eventually conducted into Nauvoo. All sorts of pomp and, and ceremony and the band is playing and people are turning out to kind of welcome him home and escort him. Uh, in and he is eventually released on a writ of habeas corpus with the Nauvoo Municipal Court. In this journal, there's a couple of veiled references to plural marriage. One of the most interesting is an entry where Willard Richards, who is keeping Joseph's journal, writes in shorthand that Joseph was sealed to Willard Richards' sister, Rhoda Richards. And at the same time, Willard Richards himself was sealed to Susan Liptrot, both as plural wives. This is an exception. Usually we don't find any references to Joseph's plural marriages in the journal. But here it is, although it has been kind of obscured uh, with Taylor shorthand. But that, uh, we've been able to decipher that and understand what, what was going on there. After the saints leave Nauvoo and come out west, there were many people who felt that well, since plural marriage had been practiced so quietly in Nauvoo, so secretly, uh, on such a limited basis, and then when the saints come out west, it goes public. And there were stories and, and, and people saying that plural marriage had originated with Brigham Young and the Mormons in Utah, not with Joseph Smith. And that was a very prevalent uh, story. And so to have this entry uh, that says uh, very clearly, albeit in shorthand, but still very clearly, that Joseph uh, took a plural wife, Rhoda Richards, on this particular day is contemporaneous evidence. It's not relying upon a reminiscent account uh, or anything like that. It is, it is contemporaneous evidence that Joseph Smith uh, did practice plural marriage in Nauvoo. Another significant entry regarding plural marriage was dated July the 12th, 1843. It was on that date that Joseph Smith first wrote down or dictated a revelation we know today as Doctrine and Covenants 132. What this entry, July 12th, 1843, is referencing is when Joseph Smith records it, not when he uh, gets the information, but when he commits it to paper. Uh, he did that, he probably wouldn't even have done it then, except that uh, by this time Emma Smith was, was really having a struggle with plural marriage. Hiram had told Joseph that in his opinion, if Joseph would just write the revelation down so that Emma could have it and hold it and look at it and reread it, it would help her through this very difficult time with it. Joseph told Hiram, I don't think so. <laughs> But Hiram prevailed, and so Joseph dictated the revelation, and William Clayton wrote it down. And then they took it to Emma and had her look at it. Joseph was correct. It did not go well with that. She was still not happy even reading the whole thing. I think our evidence on Emma is that she was conflicted with plural marriage. Literally, some days she could get her mind around it, and then the next day she could not. You, you see that kind of going, and that back and forth. Uh, showing up uh, with other records that we've got. 
And by this time, you know, she really was, I think, just saying, I can't do this much more. And this effort to, to help her through it by recording the revelation, um, whatever, whatever it, it did with her, it kind of did signal the end of Joseph's taking plural wives. For one example of Joseph Smith's real thoughts and feelings, I love the story of Porter Rockwell returning at the, and interrupting the Christmas party at the Smith home on December 25th, 1843. He arrives amid the festivities, comes in acting, we're told in the journal, like a drunken Missourian. And Joseph Smith, in process of trying to throw him out of doors from the party along with a few others, recognizes him as his friend who's been imprisoned in Missouri for many months. Richards describes Joseph recognizing Porter Rockwell and says that he learns that it's Rockwell to his great surprise and joy untold. I think that phrase captures a kind of personal enthusiasm and emotion that we don't catch in, in many of Joseph Smith's uh, writings from this time period. But it shows how relieved he was to meet uh, meet with this long lost friend who has been in, incarcerated in Missouri. And also as, as this kind of victory for the saints, the, uh, uh, another reason to celebrate on Christmas Day that, that uh, both Rockwell and, as they'll come to find out the following day, Daniel Avery have been released from Mormon imprisonment and are, and are now back among them, that, that they can triumph over their foes. It was December 1843 when two Latter-day Saints living in Illinois were arrested by Missouri state officers and taken across the river into Missouri to face charges. Is that extradition or kidnapping? The kidnappings of Daniel and Philander Avery are probably as little known now as they were well known at the time. They were the subject of countless newspaper articles of consequent court cases throughout Illinois and Missouri. They were really on the tongues of every Mormon in Nauvoo and through citizens of Western Illinois. Newspaper battles about the justification for taking them over to Missouri. It was the hot topic of the winter of 18. 1843. But its real significance to members of the church, uh, and as it appears to in the journals, to Joseph Smith particular, particularly, is in its relation to this kind of reaching a point of no return with, between the Mormons and their neighbors. This, uh, this escalation, for instance, the Nauvoo Legion until the kidnapping of the Averys, the Mormons had never actually threatened usage of the Legion. But in the debate that arose from the Avery kidnappings and militarization of some of the other Illinois militia units in the area, for the first time in Mormon papers, in the Nauvoo neighbor and in extras to the Nauvoo neighbor, you start having articles saying, well, we have this military body, we're ready to use it. So the Avery kidnapping is really the center of a web of events that come out of that. And really, I believe, the point that we can start dating the the uh, this increase in tensions until it's just an untenable situation for the Mormons to remain in Illinois and even in the country. Their solution, of course, at, at the time is not to move to another state, but simply out of the United States altogether. 1844 was an election year. There would be a new president of the United States elected. With that, Joseph Smith and his brethren wrote to the five principal candidates to find out their feelings about helping the Latter-day Saints. The five candidates to whom Joseph Smith wrote letters were Lewis Cass, Martin Van Buren, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Richard Johnson. And of those five, only three responded. Lewis Cass and John C. Calhoun, the more prominent. Henry Clay also responded, although much later in the game. Their responses were kind of typical of the politics of the day, pointing to the local government philosophy that the federal government could give them no aid if the state of Missouri would, uh, would not grant them redress. If your application for the redress to which you consider yourselves entitled 
has been, as you say, rejected by the constituted authorities of the state of Missouri and by Congress, I do not see what power the President of the United States can have over the matter or how he can interfere with it. Lewis Cass. As a reaction to the inaction of the candidates, Joseph Smith wrote down his views on the powers of government. That document is titled, General Smith's Views of the Powers and Policy of the United States. In the views of the power and policy of the government, Joseph advocates for the abolition of slaves and the equality of persons of color, that they should be equal under the law. Among the many tenets in Joseph Smith's views on the power and policy of government, he advocates for American expansion. In fact, he advocates that the nation expand and incorporate all of the North American continent. Uh, and, and he advocates for a stronger national government that could ensure the protection of uh, the rights of all people. He also is uh, suggesting that there be greater flexibility for the president, that there would be no question that the president would have the power to send out armies to suppress mob actions wherever they may be, and regardless of the state's rights political ideology that was so prevalent at the time. He's calling for something that would have been very uh, different than what most people saw the government as at the time. By January 29th, 1844, Joseph Smith had made the decision to campaign for President of the United States. We don't have a document from Joseph Smith laying out point by point his reasons for uh, campaigning for the presidency. Um, but. In my mind, the biggest reason comes in, uh, in a powerful example, I think, in April 1844, um, after Joseph has you know, declared his intent to run, and the saints have a conference in which some 350 men are called to go on missions to 25 different states and a territory of the United States to go on a twofold mission to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to campaign for Joseph Smith's presidency to try to get electors to vote for Joseph Smith as an independent. But the key is they take with them a copy of Joseph Smith's views of the powers and policy of the government. And so whether Joseph Smith intended to run so he could win, I don't know. But him writing that document and the sending out of those missionaries uh, with that document and the message um, of the gospel and the message that Joseph Smith was trying to lay out for the future of the country, how it ought to protect people uh, and their constitutional rights and civil liberties was a pretty powerful thing. During this last 14 months of Joseph's life, he delivers over 60 discourses to the saints and various other groups of people. And a lot of those are recorded in the journal. Some of them are just briefly referenced. And then we've got other accounts that have allowed us to kind of know what he was saying, even if it was just briefly referenced. In these discourses, you see how excited Joseph Smith was about the restoration of the gospel and how excited he was to move things forward. This all kind of comes to a head in the, the very famous King Follett Discourse, which he delivers on the 7th of April, 1844, just a matter of months before he's killed. Uh, this was kind of a funeral sermon given to eulogize his friend King Follett, who had recently died. And in this discourse, he talks about the nature of God and man's potential to become like God. It's one of the most profound discourses that we have from Joseph Smith. To this day, the martyrdom of the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram remains one of the most emotionally traumatic events in Latter-day Saint history. And it is in this volume where that story is told in the most detail. In this volume, we have reproduced Willard Richard's journal from the 23rd of June up to where it ends right before the attack on the 27th of June. That's in an appendix. And just provides a lot of detail. He's writing hurriedly. Probably the intent is to keep a detailed record in his own journal. And then 
assuming everything's going to turn out okay later on, transfer this to Joseph's journal when they get back to Nauvoo and, and maybe clarify things. And so it's very brief, it's very choppy, sometimes very difficult to read, but it, it's the one very intimate glimpse we have into the last couple of days of Joseph's life and everything that happened uh, in Carthage. Willard stayed by his side uh, to, to the very end. There's a lot more to Joseph Smith's life in the last 14 months uh, before he's martyred in Carthage jail than, you know, a, an average uh, interested person in Latter-day Saint history might know. And those nuances and interesting stories can be found in Journals Volume 3. The journal entries will lay them out and the annotation therein will help kind of flesh out some of those stories that people might not know about the prophet and his life in those last months and, and really come to an understanding of what it was that he went through, all the many and varied aspects of his life that he faced in those uh, final months of his life. The angel Moroni told Joseph Smith at the beginning in 1823 that his name would be had for good and evil among all men, and that has proven true. When considering how important this matter is to judge, what better way to learn the truth about the prophet Joseph Smith than through the pages of his own journal? Joseph Smith Papers, Journals, Volume 3 available now. I'm Glenn Rawson, and thank you. <laughs>